Hello, my name is John Gerard, and I'm absolutely delighted to be joining you for KM Russia. Today I'd like to share my thoughts on something that seems to be capturing many people's imagination these days, and of course that's big data. In particular, I'd like to share some lessons that I've learned as a knowledge management evangelist. However, before we start, I'd like to thank the entire KM Russia team for organizing what promises to be an excellent event. I look forward to engaging with all of you during our time together in Moscow. I was asked to provide a brief introduction. As I mentioned, my name is John Gerard, and I'm very proud to hold the Peyton Anderson Endowed Chair of Information Technology at Middle Georgia State College. The endowed chairship affords me the opportunity to focus a great deal of my time on researching how technology, leadership, and culture converge to create value. Of course, I also spend a lot of time engaging with students, something I enjoy immensely. In addition to this academic position, I lead a training and consulting company. Working with real-world organizations is especially important to me as I sometimes find my academic colleagues get lost in their research and forget the practical side of what we do. Now, I think these five books clearly expose my research interests, but also my biases. Much of what we talk about in KM and in Big Data demand leaders who understand the challenges and opportunities presented by technology and culture. Before I joined the Academy, I was working as the Director of Knowledge Management for the Canadian Department of National Defense. This was my last position in a military career that spanned 24 years. I found the appointment absolutely fascinating, and one of my first tasks was to move the KM cell from the CIO's organization to the strategic headquarters to become part of our strategic change organization. I learned an awful lot about leadership and culture in the process. One of the very last things I did before I left defense was pen an article for the Canadian military journal called Defense Knowledge Management, a Passing Fad. I suppose it was one of the last things I did because I'm not sure I had the courage earlier. What I witnessed was a number of very senior leaders who simply did not believe in KM. Some of them were virgin and being very unhelpful. And the article was an attempt at explaining how KM could create value for defense. Ironically, after I left the position, many of the situations I predicted uh, came to fruition and suddenly a lot of people were dusting off the article and rereading it. I see a lot of parallels from what was happening in KM a decade ago and what I see in big data today. So my aim today is to share some of the lessons I've learned with a view to helping others who deal with uh, big data. So with this as an introduction, uh, let's see what we can learn from KM. When I was in defense, there were two KM books that were very popular in Canada. First was uh, Working Knowledge uh, by Larry Prusak, who's involved in KM uh, Russia this year, and Tom Davenport. And the second was called The Complete Idiot's Guide to uh, Knowledge Management. Now, both of these are excellent books and still uh, are the seminal works, really, in, in the field. And in both cases, they provided practitioners a glimpse of what the domain was all about. Now the second book, The Idiot's Guide, a lot of my colleagues, both practitioners and academics, didn't like that I recommended that book because of the title. But truth be told, it's an excellent book and I still recommend it to people who are trying to learn about knowledge management. And one of the authors of Working Knowledge, Tom Davenport, recently published a new book, this time called Big Data at Work. So right there we see an interest from some of the authors of KM books decade and a half ago that are now featuring in the big data space. Uh, and Davenport's not alone in writing in big data. In fact, everywhere you turn, you see uh, pieces on big data. Uh, recently, uh, Foreign Affairs uh, had a cover story on it. I never imagined I would see Foreign Affairs having a cover story on, on big data. Physicians, Executive Journal, a journal I didn't even know existed, has a cover story on big data. Of course, Harvard Business Review has. Der Spiegel has, uh, Popular Science, and even The Futurist magazine has had a cover story on big data. Uh, you know, the Futurist article on big data really is quite a good one, and it talks about how we can use the data from accidents in national parks to help prevent future accidents. 
In other words, if we mine the data of where people have gotten trouble before, what the weather was, the conditions, and other uh, issues, then perhaps we can inform people who are out hiking today what to, uh, to avoid. And I think that's the real power of big data, is to be able to mine the history to help the future. So I've been talking about big data a little bit already, and we really haven't even started to examine what it is. One of the ways I try to gauge the interest in new hype or new domains is by going to Google Trends. And if you haven't been to Google Trends, I highly recommend it. You can go there and type in a simple term. So here on this slide I have big data. And what you can see is that uh, in 2004, for the first number of years, the interest was very flat, probably scientists and some early adopters uh, looking at it. Uh, but then suddenly there's this spike in interest. And we've seen that uh, increase over the last number of years. And on this chart, we even see Google's forecast, and, and they suggest that it's going to continue to in increase. Now, of course, simply the number of searches that are being done in a field doesn't dictate that it's a, a domain per se, but it does show the interest in it. But you know, I think the interest in big data might have gone way before uh, this chart uh, predicts or talks about. Back in 1991, Teradata were some of the very first people to talk about how we could use uh, data. They talked about data anomalies and they talked about how retailers could use it. And of course, there was the famous beer and diaper story in which we discovered, or Teradata claimed to discover, that uh, retailers, or excuse me, consumers on Friday evenings, uh, many of whom were purchasing beer would also buy diapers. And the so-called beer and diapers anomaly led almost a frenzy of retailers trying to figure out how they could mine uh, their data. Of course, the story's been exaggerated a little bit over time, but the point is, is by mining the data that we already have, we can learn new things that leaders can use to make uh, better decisions. I wrote an article uh, talking about that uh, in Prairie Business Magazine, and funny enough, it's by far the most searched article and most read article, most downloaded article of anything that I've written. Uh, Prairie Business Magazine doesn't have a very large readership, but because it's online and because of the title, uh, there's an incredible amount of effort, and that was back in uh, 2008. So many people have been talking about uh, big data and the resemblance or how it could be used in terms of uh, a KM. So maybe we should ask, is big data and data mining, are these two terms synonymous? We see them used interchangeably an awful lot, it seems. So are they synonymous? And I would say no, they're probably not synonymous. And I think for us as KM practitioners, it's important for us to understand the difference. So big data is really talking about the asset, that data set that an organization uh, might own, where data mining is really a process or a handler of uh, that asset. And I think it is important for us to uh, differentiate those. Well, here's another chart from uh, Google Trends. And this shows the interest in Russia. And here you can see that there's also been a surge in interest. Uh, the first part of the chart is very flat, and that's really because up until 2011, Google didn't track uh, location data. So that doesn't mean that Russia wasn't interested. We just didn't have uh, location data. But clearly, you can see uh, from 2012 forward uh, that there's a significant interest in big data in uh, Russia. So I think there's people here and people that you'll be working with that are very, very interested in it. But let's go back a decade or two and talk about maybe where all of this came from. Uh, perhaps like some of you in the room, uh, 15 or 20 years ago, my interest was in information overload. And we spent a lot of time trying to think about what we should be doing with information overload. And we really talked about it as um, when the system was overloaded, we would call that uh, overload and we talked about the fact that there was personal information overload and in other words your employees might be suffering from that and organizational uh, information overload both of which we 
really decided were perceived. There wasn't exact measures, uh, but they were perceived uh, levels of information overload. In fact, you can go back uh, much further. Uh, Time Magazine recently did a, a cover story on the issue, and they were suggesting that some 2,000 years ago, uh, we possibly had more books than we could possibly uh, read in an entire lifetime, suggesting that even then, uh, we were suffering uh, from information overload. We can look at a variety of studies that were done uh, 15 or 20 years ago, uh, suggesting that managers complained about information overload. Uh, managers would dwell on information that seemed entertainment, but entertaining but not particularly informative. I think that still happens uh, today. How many times have you seen somebody start a legitimate search for something and then get caught up in the, the football scores or World Cup or some other uh, issue? So uh, some of these things certainly have not uh, gone away. We saw managers uh, delaying decisions because they had too much information. And of course, my good friend uh, Nick Bontis talked about the total accumulate accumulated codified database of the world, very hard to say, and the fact that it would double twice a day uh, by uh, the year 2010. And in fact, Nick was very close in that if you consider all of the duplicate data uh, that we have. And I think what we thought back then was what we needed to do is somehow control that. And if you use the faucet or tap analogy, what we really wanted to do is stop or filter uh, the flow of information. We also saw a lot of people that were discussing uh, the value of these so-called distractions. Uh, and there was one book called Distracted that suggested 28% of uh, US Workers Day was uh, lost to distractions. And perhaps that was costing the, the country something like $650 billion. Now, I'm not a real fan of these sorts of numbers. And I'm not really a fan of the methodology in this. If you believe in sort of Mintzberg style of management, you know that uh, managers have always uh, run into distractions. But the point is we were trying to measure uh, the impact of information overload. So a couple times already we've talked about knowledge and knowledge management. Perhaps it's worth uh, trying to define it a little bit. Here's one definition that uh, comes from the Tofflers, the futurists, the Tofflers, and, and they suggested that knowledge is broadly defined to include information, data, communication, and culture. And although some people like that definition, I'm not particularly a fan of it. I think it might be a little too broad. And, and I prefer uh, this definition for knowledge. Uh, knowledge or concepts, experience, and insight that provide a framework for creating and evaluating and using information. And I, and I like that because it builds on this idea of the sort of cognitive hierarchy. Uh, we're going to talk much more about uh, knowledge management in a minute. Uh, and every time I launch into this, we get into this sort of debate about definitions for, for knowledge management. I'll, I'll stop that debate now by saying to you, if you're interested in seeing other definitions, I've collected over 100 definitions, all of which are good definitions, depending on your organization. And you can take a look at those on my website at johngerard.net forward slash km. Uh, but the point is, there's many different definitions for km. Uh, knowledge management. And really, I think it is a good exercise for individual organizations uh, to derive their own definition based on their organizational uh, needs. So when we're talking about knowledge management, a great place to start is the work of Davenport and Prusak in Working Knowledge. And they sort of built on this idea of the cognitive hierarchy that we had data. And there's a number of things that you could do to that data they suggested to create information. And likewise, there were some things that you could do to information uh, to create data. And I like to think of that as KM 1.0. I know other people use different ways to categorize the development of KM. Uh, but to me, this is a, a good starting point for how a lot of organizations uh, looked at knowledge management. We then uh, saw an emphasis moving uh, towards this idea of tacit and explicit uh, knowledge. And of course, uh, Carlo O'Dell, uh, the president of APQC, famously used this chart using the iceberg analogy. And in her book, If Only We Knew What We Know, uh, talked about this idea of the difference between explicit and tacit knowledge. Now, Carla never argued that she was the first person to do it. And most of us would say that Michael Poliani was one of the first uh, in his book, Personal Knowledge. And I think that that and the work of Professor Nonaka on the so-called SECI model might be what we consider uh, knowledge management uh, 
And in fact, I used that work myself when I was in defense, and I used Nonaka's Seki model. I put that in a model, in a Nukshuk model uh, for knowledge management, and really reminded leaders that there were uh, certain processes, things that we could do to either tacit or explicit knowledge. Never suggesting that we had to follow this completely, but it was a good way for uh, leaders to compartmentalize uh, how we might deal with uh, knowledge. So in this Inukshuk model, you can see on the bottom is the foundation of knowledge management, which I believe is that technology, leadership, and culture, the TLC. Uh, built upon that were the processes, uh, really based on Professor Nonaka's work, and then we had to measure it. And perhaps this was uh, knowledge management uh, 2.0. Uh, so again, I, I realize that different people uh, suggest different ways of talking about the development of knowledge management, but this might be the second attempt at knowledge uh, management. And you know, it seems whenever I uh, show this slide of my Nookshuk model or talk an awful lot about uh, Nonaka's work, I, I have a number of people who kind of roll their eyes and, and think that might be great in the academic sphere, but it really doesn't uh, work in the real world. And whenever people are thinking that and starting to ignore me when I talk. I think of a, a short video uh, that reminds us just how important it is uh, to have a way to capture your knowledge. So watch this short video. So Dan, do we have everything we need for this meeting? It's all right here, sir. Is your data backup as reliable as it should be? Don't worry, sir. He told me everything. Ours is Brightstore Storage Software. Well, no matter how many times I see that video, it always hurts when I see Dan walk into that filing cabinet. And although it uh, is sort of a humorous look at it, what's important to take away from that video is that we must develop ways to ensure that the decision makers have the knowledge that they need at the right time to make those uh, decisions. In fact, that's often how people describe uh, knowledge management is getting the right knowledge to the right people at the right time. Well, let's turn our attention to uh, culture. One of the key elements of uh, the TLC that I often talk about. And I like to start off by looking at these posters. These posters come from the Second World War and they were called Loose Lips Sink Ships. And really they came from the idea that the Americans had a number of GIs in England and uh, waiting for the D-Day invasion. And if they were to share what they knew, perhaps down at the pub, uh, the word would get out and the enemy would know uh, what was happening. Well, I think that campaign created a generation or more of people who believed and applied the so-called need to know uh, principle. And that is still alive and well. Here's a more recent poster from the United States. And if we take a look at that, blow it up a little bit, we can see uh, that it still says uh, endorse and apply the need to know uh, principle. And although some of us were making some headway into convincing leaders that we should move towards an environment of need to share. Uh, a number of things have happened in the last little while, uh, not the least of which is WikiLeaks and Edward Snowden. Uh, and no matter what side of the transparency crusade you are on, uh, you cannot argue that this has had an impact on how leaders uh, think about their organizations and whether they can trust people. And in fact, that's probably a good thing for leaders to be doing. Uh, I think the work of uh, David Logan in tribal leadership with his colleagues uh, reminded us that there are different stages in organizations. He talks about the five stages of culture, and I think when we look at this from a knowledge management point of view, if you are an organization in stages one, two, or maybe even three, it's difficult to share openly because you do not have people that are really vested in your organization. Now, if you're fortunate enough to be in levels four or five, of tribal leadership, then you're in the environment where uh, people, you're working in a trusted environment and people uh, probably can be allowed to share as much as they want. But especially think if you're in some of those lower levels, what should you be doing? 
And I think sometimes this is why knowledge management has failed in the past. If you have an organization uh, that is primary level one or level two uh, people, people who really don't like where they are, can we trust them with some of our most important organizational assets? And so rather than developing a knowledge management system, perhaps your first order of business is creating that organizational change to make sure that your organization is in fact ready to apply the principles of knowledge management. I highly recommend uh, that you take a look at his work. It's some of the best work in differentiating the different stages of organizations and at what point we really can uh, work in that trusted environment. Now if we move to the idea of leadership, which I think is key, uh, this story is very telling. Uh, this is a story five years after that fateful day in New York City. Uh, this is an article that was written on September 11, 2006, talking about the tragedy and the horrible loss of life of the Fire Department of New York, and especially their Special Operations uh, Command. And if I blow that up so you can see it, you can see that they lost 1,600 years of experience in a single day. And so the question I often ask leaders is, what would happen to your organization if you had a tragedy like that, or if people just left your organization? Now, we all hope that we will not have a tragedy like that, uh, but the best organizations prepare for it. And the good news from this story, if there can be any good news, is the Fire Department of New York was quickly able to recover because they had in place practices and procedures to make sure that everybody shared their knowledge. So after every major event, uh, they would come back together, do an after action review, and make sure that throughout the organization, everybody was aware. That high fidelity organizational learning is extremely important part of knowledge management. Now an idea we often talk about in leadership is this idea of open leadership and Charlene Lee in her book Open Leadership uh, talks about some of the things that are important uh, for leaders and key to us is this idea of sharing uh, constantly to build trust, forgiving failure and holding openness accountable and in fact she offers two leaders an opportunity to do a knowledge audit. What I have found is that many leaders are very interested in finding out about their organizations, but when you ask them if they're interested in doing a leadership audit that will also ask tough questions about their practices, they're not quite so keen uh, to do it. So what is it that leaders need? Uh, let's take a, a look at this short video. Uh, this is uh, former Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld, who famously won the Plain English Campaign's Foot in the Mouth Award. Now, the Plain English Campaign consider themselves the guardians of the English language, and every year they award the Foot in the Mouth Award to some politician or other celebrity, an actor, who says something, well, something that really violates the principles of the English language. Now this is what Rumsfeld said. What is the message there? The message is that there are known knowns. There are things we know that we know. There are known unknowns. That is to say, there are things that we now know we don't know. But there are also unknown unknowns. There are things we do not know we don't know. Well, there you have it, the wisdom of Rumsfeld. Uh, but the reality is, is even though he was awarded the Foot and Mouth Award, he actually might have said something that was brilliant. Now, a good friend of mine, uh, Alex Bennett, with her husband David, in their book, uh, wrote a chapter on exactly what Rumsfeld uh, talked about. And they have a matrix that looks at the four components of knowledge if you like and so in the lower left corner are the no one no ones that's the area that most of us want to be in in the upper left quadrant are the unknown uh, no ones those are things that we should know in an organization but perhaps we do not uh, often this is because of silos or other managerial obstacles but these are things that we can correct if we want to 
In the bottom right hand corner are the known unknowns. So when we know we don't know something, that we can plan for that and take action. Uh, we often call that competitive intelligence. But the upper uh, right hand corner is the one that's of uh, most interest to what Rumsfeld said, and that's the unknown unknowns. And this is a little bit harder uh, to describe. A lot of us are involved in planning at the business level, but if we think about personal uh, planning, and I asked you this question, what is the most planned personal event? If I gave you a minute to think about that, I think many of you would agree that it's weddings. No matter what country you're in, uh, weddings seem to take a lot of our uh, time, either as a, a bride or a groom, or parents of the bride or groom, or relatives of the bride or groom. Somehow we all get involved in the planning of that. And yet even the best planned things sometimes don't go exactly to plan. <laughs> Well, that might be considered an unknown unknown. I don't care how much you planned that wedding. I don't think you ever would have thought that a UAV would fly direct in to the bride or groom. Now, in the real world, in the business world, it's a much more serious matter. And I don't suggest that you should spend an incredible amount of time in that sphere. But there are some things that we can learn from it. And I think that is where the idea of big data comes to play. So if we return to the cognitive hierarchy and we look at uh, this idea, we might be able to expand the top part of the cognitive hierarchy and break that part we call knowledge into some other components, perhaps knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. And I would go out as far as to say that KM 2.5 might really be seeking wisdom and not uh, knowledge. So if we fast forward now 10 years ago, or 10 years, and start looking at uh, what big data is, uh, here are some definitions for big data that came out of a book that we're just finishing called Strategic Database Wisdom in the Big Data Era. And as you look at these uh, definitions, there are probably a couple terms that seem to be repeating themselves. And I think large, complex and difficult are some of the descriptors that many of us would use to define uh, big data. So if we turn to complex, I know there's many definitions for complexity. I have a very simple uh, definition for it, and I like what Marion Webster's definition says, and that's a group of obviously related units of which the degree and the nature of the relationship is imperfectly known. And I think that really uh, defines what we are looking at, and particularly in this uh, big data part. Now, if you ask the techies in the room, what they're most excited about in big data is the size, in other words, the large component, and the difficult in coming up with a new algorithm or doing something uh, to partition databases to make us search them faster. And that's all very important. Uh, but if you ask the business leaders in the audience, uh, they will go back to those unknown unknowns that Rumsfeld talked about. And so perhaps uh, knowledge management 3.0 is moving towards that. And if we use that retail example again, when we purchase something, we can analyze that and create information. Uh, and from that, we can create knowledge. But that's a very almost scientific approach to knowledge creation. Uh, Walmart famously shared with us a few years ago that they had, this was back in 2004, that they had 460 terabytes of data. And that seemed like so much back then. But what they reminded us is they used that data to provide decision makers with options about the anomalies. And again, their famous data mining story had to do with Pop-Tarts and the fact that when there was a hurricane forecast in southern US cities, uh, for some unknown reason, 
consumers would want to purchase uh, Pop-Tarts uh, seven times more often than if there was not a hurricane forecast. And so Walmart used that example to talk about how they really created that wisdom because the decision makers could decide what to do with the knowledge that we created. And I think that's a very powerful idea for us uh, to consider. And we've seen many examples of this now. Uh, here's a short example from IBM. How do you beat the number one seed? You just have to win 70% of your points at net and keep unforced errors under 10%. On the IBM Cloud, the US Open analyzes 41 million data points from eight years of competition to uncover key insights. Data can help show you how to win, no matter what business you're in. Today, there's a new way to work, and it's made with IBM. And it seems that IBM's not the only people looking at sporting events. Here's an interesting article about the last World Cup and how Germany apparently was using big data to uh, mine uh, their opponents and, and find out uh, how they could win. So clearly big data can help us with that, but there must be more to it than just that. So let's ask ourselves this question. What do we know about big data? Well, a couple things we know, and again, here's some uh, data from Google uh, combined with those uh, cover stories that I told you about. Uh, what we can see is big data is both global and multidisciplinary. Uh, here we can see that all over the world is interested in uh, big data, India and Singapore, uh, South Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, United States, South Africa, uh, Russia is also on the list a little bit uh, further down. Uh, but there's great interest in the field and it's across many, many disciplines. We can see that uh, and this part of Google Trends shows us some related searches to big data. So when people are searching big data, what else are they looking for? And what we see is analytics and a number of technology focused pieces, which leads us to believe that perhaps uh, the solution is just in the technology. The new Newsday app is better than the newspaper in all kinds of ways. Except for one. Get Newsday every day in a whole new way. And so the point of that video was to remind us that the newest technology is not always the best technology. And I think that applies to big data as well. I think too many people are jumping on the bandwagon and not really, really understanding what it's all about. I was at an event not that long ago where somebody came up to me and said that in their organization they had stopped categorizing any of the documents. They were told by their leader just to dump them all and that they would use Hadoop or other uh, big data technologies to uh, mine the data when and if they needed it. We had an interesting discussion about it and I asked them, how much storage space have you allocated if you're gonna put everything there, including all of your video and audio, emails and all your documents, and I was told they had one terabyte of data for the entire organization, which clearly would be filled up uh, very, very quickly. So we have to think about how we're going to adopt the technology, and even if it's the best technology for our organization. You know, Richard Branson recently uh, wrote in his book uh, that he carries a hard-covered book everywhere he goes and records notes in there, not in an iPad or some other uh, technology. So we have to, as leaders, think about the, the best uh, technology. Now here's a word cloud of all the words related to big data. And as you look at these, I wonder if you agree that the largest words in this cloud are the most important ones. And as you look at those, you will find many of those, I believe, are very technologically focused. And I think there's some real missing points here. And if we zoom in in a couple, we can see that things like answers and cost are very, very small in that uh, word cloud. And I think that's one of the challenges that 
tech organizations are running into. They're getting very excited about the technology, but not thinking about the cost or the answers that the system will bring to the end user. And we saw that an awful lot in early adoptions of KM, where we spent a lot of money on technology, uh, but we weren't entirely sure what the measures of success were, and it almost seemed that we didn't really care about the cost. Uh, so let's really think about the measures of success and the cost. Now part of big data is the size. And I'm sure you've seen uh, this chart that came out back in 2011 that talked about how much data is being produced every minute. If I bring up the chart from 2013, and there's many others we could look at, but because these both come from the same source, it's interesting to uh, compare them. So if we take a look at how emails have grown over time, or if we look at Facebook, we can see the significant increase in the amount of data being produced every minute of every day. So just take a minute to reflect on those and think about uh, your organization. And we get very focused on size when we talk about big data. Here's another chart that's suggesting that uh, perhaps there's seven exabytes of data total being stored by uh, businesses around the world. And so we think that big data is only in the realm of organizations that have exabytes. But I don't think that's true. In my own organization, uh, big data become, became relevant at a much smaller size. In my office at work, we use Windows. In my office at home, we use Mac. When I try to transfer files back and forth, it's complicated. And basically, I have a four gigabyte size limit if I want to transfer between Mac OS and Windows. And so to me, big data starts at four gigabytes. And so my point is, is it isn't necessarily measured in exabytes, it's when your business processes uh, must change. So think about how that might play uh, for you. One of the real challenges facing organizational leaders today, when they're thinking about big data and the implications for their organization, is where to get information that they can believe, information that's honest, information that will help them drive decisions. So here we have a YouTube video developed by IBM talking about the amount of data that a single aircraft might produce on a flight from London Heathrow to JFK in the US. And it's suggesting that each aircraft engine could generate 10 terabytes every 30 minutes. That's an incredible amount of data, especially when you consider the amount of aircraft flying. Here's another article by uh, Boeing talking about Virgin Atlantic creating half a terabyte of data in a flight. That's a huge uh, difference. And leaders really are relying on experts like you to give them uh, the honest answer. And the challenge you might be having is it really depends what the leader wants. Both answers could be correct. IBM saying 10 terabyte per engine is correct. You can do the math and it is possible to have that amount of data. Uh, likewise, uh, Boeing talking about Virgin Atlantic producing half a terabyte of data is also correct. And it really depends what the organization wants to use with the data or use the data for perhaps. And I think it's up to you to try to find ways to make sure that your organization knows what they want to do with the data and has a plan to measure the success. We saw exactly the same thing in a knowledge management where many over organizations were overbuying what they needed. And so they would spend an incredible amount of money to do what was technically feasible but not what they needed to do for their organization. Now, I'm not an aerospace expert, so I'm not gonna say which one of those is correct, but it becomes very confusing to organizational leaders when they see uh, that much of a difference.
So let's go back to what we talked about over a decade ago. Remember, we used the analogy of the tap or the faucet and the flow of information. And what I would ask you now is which way should we be turning that? Should we be turning it on or off? In other words, should we pr be providing more data to our organizations? Or do you still believe, like many of us did a decade ago, that it's time to start filtering uh, that data out? I'll leave that for you uh, to consider. Uh, one other area that's of great interest to me is the continued disconnect between the IT side of an organization and the strategic or line of business side of an organization. I mentioned when I was in defense, one of my very first tasks was to move the KM organization from the CIO shop to the strategic headquarters. And back then, we saw that there was a disconnect in between what the CIO wanted to provide to the organization and what their strategic headquarters thought they needed. Now, of course, some of that's leadership and of course, some of that's personality driven. Uh, but on this chart, you can see that in terms of big data, we're seeing a similar phenomenon to what we saw with knowledge management, that there's a big disconnect between what the IT side of the house and what the organizational strategy or line of business uh, side of the house is thinking both in terms of who's responsible for it, uh, who's uh, developing it, and who's funding it. So I think the lesson to be learned in that part is have a good discussion in your organization about who should be doing it. Perhaps it's our job to help your leaders, the CEO or the CEO, see what's in their data. And perhaps it's most important that all of us enable them to be able to take that deep dive into the data, the so-called big data, and see what they really need to see to make the best possible decisions. Take a look at this chart. This comes from a bank in South Africa, but I think it's a very interesting story being told. So in the foreground, you see three hyenas. In the near ground, you can see three lion cubs. And so those hyenas have seen the lion cubs, and they think they're going to get a free lunch. And they're so occupied, preoccupied, by what's in the immediate foreground, easily within reach, those three lion cubs, that they've lost the big picture. And they're not taking the time or making the effort to take a deep dive into the data. And if they did take that deep dive, if they invested the time and energy to survey the entire plane, in this case, I think they would make a different decision. And as you look at this picture, perhaps you can see that there's more than three lions in this picture. And in fact, the lionesses who are hiding in the brush are the ones who are going to have the free lunch. And I think this is a good analogy for what we're seeing with CIOs and CEOs uh, when they think about big data. Too many are rushing into it, not understanding what they're getting into, and trying to get the quick wins, those lying cubs. In fact, it takes a plan. We really need to think about how to implement big data into our organizations, how to seamlessly weave it in to our decision making invest in it where necessary, make sure we have the right resources if we're going to be successful. Too many organizations are trying to quickly implement big data, and then they're not reaping the benefits that they could have with a well thought out plan. So think about big data, and think about those parallels that we've been talking about in terms of knowledge management. I think there's a lot to be learned uh, from that. And I would go as far as to argue that, in fact, big data might be KM 3.0. Maybe it's 4.0. I don't know what the number it is. But I think what it is, big data is another tool in the toolbox for us as knowledge management practitioners to employ when the time is right. Thank you so much. Here are my contact details. This is the view from my office. If there's anything that I can do to help you, 
please do not hesitate to contact me. I look forward to engaging with you throughout KM Russia.